Hello. Before I begin, uh, we found somebody's parking um, ticket. So please check to make sure you have yours. We're going to put it by the check-in table so you can come and get it later and we'll have it there for you. Hello, everyone. Buenos dias. Welcome to the Central Library. Bienvenidos a la Biblioteca Central. Uh, my name is Diane Olivo Posner, and I'm the principal librarian for the Exploration and Creativity Department. The ENC Department coordinates the Los Angeles Public Library's LA Made programming. And to my left is Wendy Westgate, the amazing librarian who is the lead coordinator for all of our programs. So please give her a hand because oh. they're amazing. <laughs> LA Made is a series of cultural programs funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And our fourth season offers 165 educational and entertaining programs to choose from, taking place both here at the Taper and at branches across the system. And now, without further ado, I would like to welcome to the stage Anitra Bishop, archivist at the Columbia Memorial Space Center, who will introduce today's program. Thank you. Hello, and thank you so much for attending today's panel, LA Made, From LA to the Moon, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo landing. My name is Anitra Bishop, and I am the archivist at the Columbia Memorial Space Center in Downey, California. We at the Columbia Memorial Space Center are so thankful to both the LA Public Library and LA Made for partnering with us to present this panel to you today. I will start us off today with a few slides which will provide a foundation of information about the Apollo era of aerospace and the aerospace industry in Southern California, as well as provide some context about where and who built the Apollo spacecraft. Serving as NASA's official living tribute to the crew of the 2003 Space Shuttle Columbia disaster, the Columbia Memorial Space Center is located where the Apollo and Space Shuttle spacecraft were designed and built by NASA contractor North American Aviation, later known as Rockwell International. The mission of the Columbia Memorial Space Center is to ignite a community of critical and creative thinkers through world-class programs, events, and engaging exhibits. Our archival collections are comprised primarily of artifacts relating to the creation of the Apollo and space shuttles, with pieces ranging from various spacecraft heat shields to photographs, letters, schematics, ephemera, as well as models of North American and Rockwell space aircraft. Currently on display is our new exhibit, Apollo 11, Building, Living, and Remembering in Spacetown, USA. This is the ecosystem of aerospace in the mid-century Southern California. After, provide, proving to be an after proving to be an aeronautic powerhouse during World War II, the mid-century saw California greatly expand into the aerospace industry. This map shows how companies like North American Aviation, Rocketdyne, Lockheed, and JPL created an ecosystem of aerospace. And for those of you who may not be aware where Downey or North American is, it's this big one right here. <laughs> this photo is the North American aviation site in Downey, shown here in the late 1960s or at the height of the Apollo era. It can be kind of difficult to understand just how large this facility actually was during its time. Imagine a property twice the size of Disneyland. It had its own fire department and provided employment to approximately 30,000 workers. You can see here, whoop, there we go, is building one, which is comprised of approximately 1 million square feet. Just below it is building 290, which is famous because it's where the final assembly of spacecraft went on. For those of you who may know the area well, this diagonal street up here is Lakewood, and right through here is the Imperial Highway. All that's left of this original facility is a small group of buildings right here. Other than that, it is now uh, a strip mall, a movie theater, and our museum, which is located where the parking lot is, right about there. <laughs> This right here is a completed North American aviation product. Both the command and service modules, or the CSM when combined, 
were designed and built at the Downey site, as well as, oh, not, photo, not pictured here, the second stage of the Saturn V rocket and the launch escape tower. Uh, this photo taken in 1965 shows a small fraction of the building one shop floor. Remember, this whole building took up one million square feet of space. And this is just a small fraction where you can see some of the Apollo command modules being worked on. And we're gonna go backwards a little bit. <laughs> the approximately 30,000 workers who called the Downey site home worked around the clock shifts and typically worked a minimum of 52 hour work weeks during the height of the Apollo project. This photo shows the last stop on the assembly line of the Apollo 11 command module. At the Columbia Memorial Space Center, our goal for the 50th anniversary has been to show how impactful and important the work done by individuals and North American aviation was in relation to the Apollo, con the Apollo project. These are the people who ensured that our astronauts made it safely, the space to the moon and back home again. Please note the diversity of these individuals. Women and men, all ages, all races, all education levels coming together to triumph. We have a little bit of a change up in our programming today, unfortunately. Uh, Ms. Susan Engel, who had a 30 plus year career with North American Aviation, Rockwell and Boeing, was not able to make it. And also, unfortunately, your museum president was also not able to be here. However, we do have a wonderful substitute for him in the more than qualified moderator for you today. Mr. William Pomerantz is the current Vice President for Special Projects at Virgin Orbit in Long Beach, where he's ensuring that the legacy of Southern California's contribution to aerospace continues. Thank you. <laughs> well, hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Anitra, and to Diane for having us here today. Uh, I am really honored to be up on stage in front of you today uh, alongside these uh, awesome individuals and the others that they represent. I'm so excited about this kind of event because um, even in a year like this one, when so much of our society has been focused on celebrating the 50th anniversary of the first time humans touched down on the moon, it becomes really easy for us to think of that as the story of two individuals, or maybe two and a half if you count Mike Collins. Some, sometimes that's how the, the, the media perception is, right? You, you'd get this idea that Neil and Buzz built all the spacecraft themselves and they designed the trajectories and, and somehow they were, uh, they were at the bottom of the launch stack and, and lighting the igniters and, and then climbing up to the top. Uh, I had the wonderful fortune of, of getting to meet all the, the Apollo crew members, Apollo 11 crew members, they're all spectacular. They're not quite that spectacular. Um, there was a huge workforce uh, all around the nation that was intimately involved in every bit of Apollo and all the things that came before it and all the king things that came since it. Uh, and I, I, the other reason I really like to do it, especially at an institution like here at the LA Central, Li Central Library, is as far as I'm concerned, you cannot tell the story of Southern California without talking about aerospace, and nor can you tell the story of aerospace without talking about Southern California. Just a huge amount of the things that have inspired literally billions of people all around the planet happened you know, within a short drive uh, from here. Short, at least in terms of distance, if not always in terms of time. Um, and the other nice thing about that, and Anitra touched on this in, in, her, um, in, her, uh, in her opening remarks, you know, the Apollo era certainly didn't have the same view of diversity as we have in our modern society, but anytime you do something in Southern California, uh, I think you're gonna take on a, a little bit more of a diverse workforce than you might have seen or expected just from the pictures. So. Um, I'm not going to do lengthy introductions uh, of the three guests we have on stage because actually I want them to do that, uh, and I'll ask them to do that shortly after I impose on Chuck to uh, help me out with my introductory remarks and provide some context for their program. But if I could just quickly give you their names and a tiny bit of, of their backgrounds, uh, so I'll just go in order. Uh, John Perez was a site photographer and a lab photographer uh, who helped working uh, on a variety of parts of the program, including on all the recovery and shakedown of the Apollo capsules uh, as they were finishing each of their missions. Jerry Blackburn was an engineer in the Apollo program and the space shuttle program. Uh, he is the author of the book, Downey's Aerospace History, 1947 and 1999. I, we were chatting in the green room. I'm hopeful that there's a second volume coming to focus on some of those things. Uh, and Chuck Lowry uh, was an engineer also on the Apollo program and the space shuttle program. He was responsible for a number of systems across the spacecraft, including uh, a, a huge role on the parachutes. And in fact, if NASA has parachute questions to this day, I think he's still on the short list of folks that get a, get a phone call. 
Now, as I look out at the audience, I see a few people who I'm guessing know everything about Apollo, and a few of you uh, who not only you weren't alive, maybe even your parents weren't alive when some of this happened. I was gonna give a really quick introduction to the Apollo program, but it seems silly for me to do that um, when I'm on stage with three, th these three gentlemen. So Chuck, you were kind enough to offer to do just a, a few minutes on what Apollo was before we delve into the specifics of you all's contributions. Yeah, let me tell you about Apollo. Let's start at the end of World War II, about 1946. Came out of that war and we were a technical giant within our United States and we seemed to think that we, uh, we were way ahead of everybody else. Russia came out at the same time, kind of a beat down uh, place, the Soviet Union I'm really talking about. They took a hard beating during, in, in their homeland during the war, but, and they went into a, a period of great secrecy and they were communist, of course, and so here we were allies through the war, but after the war, we, we really weren't. A lot of distrust, and you've heard the term Cold War. Well, that's, that's how that all happened. Well, there came a time that the United States was going to put uh, a satellite into orbit around the Earth. This was a startling idea that nobody had ever thought of, it seems, and and we were on, the, on track to do that. And all of a sudden, the Russians, Soviet Union, beat us at our very own game, 1957. And uh, we then came along very quickly. We put some satellites up there, too. These are just tiny baseball size, you know, this, this big. And we were trying to catch up with them. And we were humiliated because they had beat us. Nobody beats the United States. And here we were. So then uh, we're, we're, we're in this space race all of a sudden. And uh, then in 1961, when we were thinking about putting people in orbit, which is another startling idea, the Soviets beat us. Gargarian was launched in 1961. About a month after that, we launched Alan Shepard, our first man in space but he really didn't go into orbit. He merely went up and down, 15-minute flight. And, you know, we thought that was going to be a big deal. But the Russians had already orbited a man around the Earth. So we were really behind in this uh, technology race and the space race, as we now call it. Well, we wanted to catch up, and, uh, and we were on a track to do that. But we knew that it was going to take years. The Russians beat us and cleaned our clocks for years. They had the first probe on the moon, on Venus. They had the first man in space, the first dog in space, the first woman in space, first extra vehicular. They beat us at every turn, clear on up until the late um, 60s. Well, we're trying to catch up all this time. So when John F. Kennedy announced that we're going to put people on the moon and bring them home safely. The only experience we had was Alan Shepard's 15-minute suborbital flight. So you got, you got to admire John F. Kennedy for having that kind of guts. Now let's talk about him. He was our president. He, he was trying to recover from uh, an embarrassing situation where the uh, we had in some of our CIA people had organized uh, what they called the Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba and lost, and it was awful, humiliating. And uh, so he was trying to come out of that. And, and Von Braun was one of his close friends. Von Braun was telling him all along, hey, John F. Kennedy, you need to be financing big time space plans. So Kennedy uh, picked up on that, and he uh, announced in, in, I think it was November of 61, we're going to the moon. So that kicked off this big program that we all talk about as being Apollo. Well, contracts were let. Our company, North American Aviation, was recipient of the big one with the command service module. Uh, the Congress was behind us. The public was not necessarily. Um, I'll tell you a little story. When I was invited to come and work on the Apollo program, 
uh, I was uh, back east in Ohio, and I was in a church setting of some sort, and the leader of our group that was speaking to us says, did you know what our crazy Congress is doing? They're talking about putting people on the moon. How many people believe we're going to go to the moon? Well, my hand went up, <laughs> and I looked around, and nobody else's. And my wife was sitting there. Her hand didn't even go up. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the way it was. It, it was a crazy idea. But uh, we worked, and we worked hard. And out of all that, you know, we, uh, it was called the greatest technical achievement ever. Did you know that on the, the time that Apollo uh, 11 landed on the moon, there was 560 million people watching that on TV around the world? And uh, we, we launched uh, six flights out of White Sands unmanned to test our abort system. We launched four unmanned spacecraft out of Florida to test heat shields and aerodynamics. And then we launched... 15 manned flights. Now, four of those were, um, were suborbital. Uh, like, I mean, uh, we didn't go to the moon except for Apollo 8 that went around the moon. We didn't land on it. And then we had six lunar landings. We had Apollo 13. Everybody knows about Apollo 13. It didn't land on the moon. It went around it. And then we had three Skylabs. Nobody knows about Skylabs anymore. They were a small space station that was attached to the Apollo program. Then we had one Apollo-Soyuz test project, a joint mission with the Russians. That kind of broke the ice. We then were then partners with Russia instead of competitors. And now we have a space station up there that's jointly uh, run by b both countries and many countries. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you. See you Definitely much better than I could have done. I, I love that story about sitting in the pulpit and, uh, and, and your wife. I don't know. Did, did, uh, did Apollo come to you other gentlemen um, in a church? <laughs> or how, how, did, how did you come into these roles? How did you get your start as an individual? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, I started at the uh, North American Aviation uh, Division over in Los Angeles <clears throat> and spent a couple of years there. And then uh, the program got... Uh, be funded by the government, and so they laid all, all of the people off from, uh, from that division. But ironically, about a month later, I got a telegram. I think people remember what a telegram is, right? <laughs> I got a telegram asking if I wanted to either go to uh, Rockadyne Division over in Canoga Park or to, uh, it was called at that time, Miss Missile Division in Downey. Well, I lived in, uh, basically, I lived in South Central area, so I decided, you know, my drive to Canoga Park would have been probably an hour or more, and we didn't have all the freeways. And then, of course, Downey was, was a lot closer. So my career started in, in Downey, and uh, actually was in 1958. And uh, I spent 37 years with, uh, with the Downey uh, Division. But my, my basic uh, involvement at the beginning was, working in the photographic services department where we did all of the printing and we did a lot of photographs and, and uh, various different kinds of services that actually was the beginning of documenting the Apollo program. Uh, and in about a couple of years later, I became a photographer. And then uh, one day I was called into the office and said, you know, they're forming this recovery team, Apollo recovery, and we'd like you to to join that team. And so I was able to be a part of that Apollo recovery team, which in, in fact, it was uh, the team that would be available every time one of the Apollos came back from the moon after splashdown and then put on a carrier and brought, brought or eventually returned to Downey. Uh, I happened to be the first person once they opened up the latch, the hatch, I mean, <laughs> and, uh, I went inside to do a photo mapping of the whole interior of all the Apollos that came back. And so I had the uh, opportunity to cover all of those particular things that were needed for NASA's documentation. And, uh, and then besides each one of those Apollo flights, uh, the astronauts would come to Downey and perform certain kinds of exercises. 
And I was going to double check with Jerry because I remember one was called C square, F square. And that's when the astronauts would come in, put on their spacesuits, and actually perform certain exercises inside the Apollo uh, capsule. And so I would cover each one of the teams that would come to Downey, and then we would photograph everything that they did. And at the end of that uh, week, if there was about a week or so, uh, they gave them a book of everything that they performed during that week that they were there. And I was able to do the photographs for them and got to meet all of these different astronauts at different times that they came to Downey. So that was what I actually ended up doing. All right, we've got church and traffic. Um. <laughs> well, I guess I'm going to change the pace a little differently. Uh, I grew up in the 1950s. Oh, yes. <laughs> Science fiction and rock and roll. But the most important part about that time was my father. He had just come back from the Second World War. And the whole generation that came back, the greatest generation, had a very specific view and outlook towards the future. And that was, we can do anything. You can do anything. I love to read books. Jules Verne was my favorite. Science fiction, Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon. These were all, they weren't dreams. These were the future. These are things that were going to happen. I always had a, uh, an aptitude and a desire to do things with chemicals and materials. We used to go out and we were the original rocket boys. We built rockets, not like you get off the shelf in the kits today. After we put a few of them through the school roof, they decided that we couldn't do that anymore. And we decided maybe we better go learn how to do it the right way. I had the uh, benefit of attending a technical school here in Southern California, <clears throat> Don Bosco Technical Institute in South San Gabriel. And because of that, when I came out of school, I was already versed in metallurgy, science, technology, and I was able to get a job in the aerospace industry here in Southern California. And I had an offer from a company over in El Segundo called North American Aviation. They needed some techs to start working on a program and called the X-15 rocket plane. Uh, they transitioned us from that into another experimental research aircraft called the XB-70. Both of those programs closed down in uh, 1964, and there were many of us looking for new work. Well, the timing was perfect because Downey was hiring and ramping up for the Apollo program. Well, gee. Let me see, do I want to go to work on the Apollo and put men on the moon? Well, you didn't have to ask me twice. <laughs> I was there. I started off working in the laboratories, uh, trying to solve one of the real problems that was facing the industry at the time. It seems that there was a little problem with rockets and boosters blowing up on the launch pad. This made astronauts very nervous. Uh, so we had to find out what was happening here. And so the laboratory work that I was doing was looking at what was causing these accidents. And we found out that the majority of them were caused by contaminants that were getting into the fluid systems. So our laboratory began working on a whole new field called contamination control, discovering how contamination affected our systems in our programs. Well, as time would have it, I began working closer and closer with the engineers and solving these problems. And we began to learn what was necessary to understand about building a spacecraft that was going to be safe enough to go to the moon. I transitioned over into the engineering labs and uh, 
there it was even more intense because now we were looking at how do you take these complex systems, millions and millions of parts, working with companies that were all over the country, thousands of companies, and how do you integrate that work in such a way that you get the success that you're looking for? We were all shocked, of course, in 1967 with the Apollo 1 disaster in Florida. And it was a wake-up call for many of us. It was, maybe we better take a closer look at what we're doing and how we're doing it and try to understand what it's going to take to get these men to the moon and get them back safely. The real message of the Apollo program was not going out and getting all the answers to everything. It was learning about how to ask the right questions. That was one of the most important. And the stories go on and on, but I think I'll turn it back over to our moderator to guide us down that path. Well, well Chuck, you shared a, a fantastic, yeah. You shared a little bit of your origin story already, but uh, could you go a little bit deeper into the, the, the kinds of things that you did at work? What, what were your main areas of focus? What kind of engineering were you working on? Yeah, when I was in graduate school, I, I worked with a parachute company and for a time, and uh, so I was uh, asked to come to North American Aviation and work on parachutes uh, connected with aircraft and missiles and so on, which I did. And then when the Apollo program came along in 1961, since I was the only one in our uh, North American, we had 125,000 employees, mine said parachutes on it, as if I knew something. <laughs> and so I was asked to go and work that system on Apollo. And then wasn't long after that, uh, I took over the ordnance, explosive devices, and then I took over the docking, and then I took over many other systems as the program went on. And I was on the program for 13 years. So I, I had, uh, you know, I was involved in many, many systems. Uh, in, in a, in a, I might explain that in a program like that, you set out to say, let's go to the moon. You got to design the hardware to do that. Somebody has to do the preliminary design that says, what's the concept even? How many boosters, how many stages, the whole thing. And then somebody has to do the detail design of those defined configurations. Somebody has to do all the analysis to show that, the, that it's strong enough and it, it can take the heat and all of that. Other people build the hardware. Other people test the hardware. And there's mission planning. There's all kinds of support, like John talks about in, in photography and documentation and all of these things. So you kind of get involved in all of that stuff. But basically, I was in the design area. And uh, we ended up, of course, mission support when they're flying the spacecraft. Since we designed the stuff, then we're supposed to know the most about our hardware. So the program goes on and on. Way beyond the design, you're still working these various aspects. Fantastic. So. It's possible to go to a great facility like the Columbia Memorial Space Center in Downey or Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and you can get really close to the Apollo hardware. I recommend everybody do that and do it over and over again if you haven't done it, again, done it in the past. Um, but it's impossible, I think, to go to one of those centers and get a sense for what it was like to actually be one of the humans working on that and making that all possible. My question for all of you in any order you'd like is, what was sort of the workplace culture like? I mean, you've got a lot of people with big brains that are doing things that no one has ever done before. Um, what's the esprit de corps? What's the sort of leadership style? Um, and yeah, what, what was it like when you roll into the office? <laughs> well, for one thing, it was very different back then in terms of a working environment. Uh, everyone, everyone that walked through the door of that plant came in with a commitment and a resolve that we were part of a team, a team that had to make this happen. We had to meet the goals that the president had set for us. We were going to put men on the moon by the 
end of the decade. Roll up your sleeves and get to work. Uh, well, just to give you a, a basic sense of it, the Apollo command module was roughly about the volume and size of a Volkswagen Beetle or a very small SUV at best today. So you have a sense of reference there. Now imagine that, and first of all, we're going to put three astronauts in there, but you have to have something for them to sit on, so we're going to put couches in there. And so three couches, three astronauts. Oh, and then they're going to need all the equipment. Oh, and you're going to want to eat. So it's like packing for a road trip, a 250,000-mile road trip. Okay, so figure that out. So that was the mission goal that NASA had given us in terms of the design aspect of it. But we got to build that thing. So now you've got a shell, and I go down, and I've got to go check this one compartment over here on the bottom side. And John, well, he's got a job over here. He's got to take some pictures over here on this side. And, oh, Chuck, he's going to check the parachutes. Can you imagine trying to get 10 or 15 people inside that little volume? They don't even have them anymore, but we used to have circuses, and there was one little exercise where the, a little car would come out with clowns that would just keep coming out and coming out and coming out. That's kind of what you felt like. Yeah, exactly. Every day was just rife with problems to solve. Of course, engineers, that's what we do. Engineers are problem solvers, and you thrive on that environment. Yes, you didn't get up in the morning and say, oh, I got to go to work today. It's, hey, I got to go to work today. I wonder if they fixed that problem we had last night. And you get there and you've got, oh, yeah, we fixed that, but we found four more that you got to go solve today. That's an exhilarating environment. Uh, they referred to the Kennedy administration sometimes as... Uh, Kennedy's Camelot. I refer to my experiences with the Apollo program as that was our cosmic Camelot. It was a unique time. It happened, and no, I don't think it's going to happen again. I, I just like to add that, and I'm sure everyone here that's there, up here at the table, uh, one of the things that would take place is that we were on call. 24-7. Uh, I mean, I can remember getting calls at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and they would say, John, you got to come in because NASA wants to close out this particular piece of the uh, part of the Apollo, and we, they have to <clears throat> install something, but before they can install it, they need to have a photograph, so you need to come down as quickly as you can. I happen to be about seven minutes away. I lived uh, seven minutes away from the, from the division, so I was the first one they'd call. And if I couldn't, you know, if I couldn't get up fast enough, they'd call someone else, right? But I was able to get there, and uh, sometimes we'd have to be like in the military. You had to sit and wait until it was ready to be signed off by NASA so we could do the picture. Then we would photograph it. They would install it. Then we'd have to take another photograph after installation. And then uh, I'd either go back home or stay there for another 10 hours. So we were always on call. And... Uh, so we, we really had, we took the pride of being involved in something, at least from my vantage point, was very special to be a part of. I'm, I'm trying to picture, put myself in your shoes and imagine what it's like, you know, you go home at the end of a long week of capsule building and uh, you're out mowing the lawn on a Saturday afternoon and your neighbor comes out and says, hey, how's work? <laughs> you know, what, what, was, what was the reaction you got from other people in LA County that weren't in the industry? Did they want to come up and shake your hand and give you a high five? Did they, under, did they just barrage you with a million questions? Were they tuned in to what you were doing? Well, it was rare that you had those moments to go home and even mow the lawn. 60-hour <laughs> work weeks were not uncommon. You came in to work problems, to get things accomplished, and you did it until the job was done. So 
there wasn't a lot of that necessarily free time. If you did have the free time, you were crashed out on the couch or, you know, uh, just trying to regenerate to get back at it. But the other problem was, even with the family, trying to talk to the family. Well, gee, Dad, what'd you do today? Um, well, I, uh, hmm, <laughs> how do you describe that? And, 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 and tell them about it. And <clears throat> you just spent all that week trying to work on that problem. You didn't want to revisit it. Other people, the boss and NASA, were going to be doing that with you. One of the, the real problems that we had to contend with was, was the, the challenge working on Apollo had with families and family relationships. Um, our incidence of divorce and uh, was higher than I think any other group in the nation at that time. Um, for, for me personally and many others, it was lost memories, birthdays missed because you were working overtime, um, ball games that you couldn't go to, uh, those memories that you couldn't get. Now, occasionally when you did end up at one of those parties and the host would come over and say, hey, he works over there at the, you know, on Apollo. Oh, wow, that awestruck. Uh, tell us about it. And then it's like you're expected, well, I'm supposed to give him a dissertation on, <laughs> on, on, on aerodynamic. For me, it was summarized, and I still use it to this day. My son, when he was in, in grammar school, they had that event where they invite the parents to come in, career day, I guess come and talk to the kids about what you do. And so he asked me, he says, Dad, can you come in and talk to the class? I said, sure. So I'm there, and I'm waiting with a couple of the other parents, and the teacher tells my son, Steve, come up and introduce your dad and tell everybody what he does. And he kind of shuffles up to the front of the class and turns around. He was not a big one for speaking. And he looks at me, and then he looks at them. This is my dad. He works at the spaceship factory. <laughs> that was the best introduction I have ever had in my life. And to this day, I enjoy being called upon to talk about life at the spaceship factory. Because, yeah, that's what we did. I want to pick up on that very thing, Jerry. Um, all, a lot of us worked a lot of hours in... Uh, we were organized in a, in a very efficient manner, and we all had jobs, and we had more jobs than we had time, and uh, we had a lot of good people, but it was just hard work, a lot of setbacks and all that. So we did work long hours and weekends and some holidays, and my advice after going through all that to people like you, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's more to life than work, and Apollo was a big deal, and, and I enjoyed every minute that I worked on it. But, uh, but it's a mistake to, to neglect your family and to neglect your other interests, your spiritual lives, whatever else, you, you know, distance, family, friends. You got to make room for that. And uh, that's my advice to, to the population today. Here, here. So uh, it, it, one of you mentioned in your opening remarks, I agree, you know, even 50 years later, most of us consider Apollo to be one of, if not the greatest technical accomplishment of our species and of any species we're aware of in existence. Um, each of you did that relatively early in your careers. How the heck do you follow up that act? Well, it was easy. At North American Aviation, I remember when I was sitting in the mission support room at at Downey, thinking, okay, we landed on the moon, we did the whole thing, what am I going to do now? It's all going to be nothingness from now. We got the shuttle contract. <laughs> so here we are, going up again. <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> there was a movie years ago, uh, several years ago, called Pay It Forward. And uh, for me, it was... Uh, well, first of all, just like Chuck, at the end of the Apollo, there was this gap, and a lot of we lost a lot of great engineers who decided to change careers. 
course, that was also the transition for many of them into infotainment and in, uh, the uh, in movie industry. But those of us who stayed on for shuttle, wow, the brass ring, my gosh, we, we had more problems than we could ever imagine. <laughs> and boy, talk about multitasking in 24 seven. Here we go again, let's go do this. So it's, uh, it's just like raising that bar and another challenge, another challenge. Well, for me, in 2000, in the year 2000, when we closed the, the uh, Downey plant and I transitioned over to Huntington Beach, I thought, well, maybe this is a chance because we were taking three different aerospace companies, McDonnell Douglas, Boeing, and North American Rockwell, and we were merging those three companies together. And I thought, hmm, that's three separate cultures that are going to have to come together to work as a team. What a great learning experience that can be. So I spent another three years watching it and learning. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it, it evolved, but it became something very different. And, and I can't remember who, who the quote's from, but if it ain't fun anymore, don't do it. And so, for me, it was retirement. But, uh, again, like Chuck, it's like, you just don't retire. And so I found myself uh, getting more involved in education, started uh, doing some teaching, started getting involved with more outreach programs. And uh, my wife and I started a small company to help STEM, uh, STEM teachers learn how to do what we learned to do in terms of developing technologies and teaching it. But still, how do you follow it? You don't. You don't. You just continue. You go on. I guess for me now, though, one of the things I enjoy more than anything else is the opportunity to share with you what it was like back then, where, what we did, what those stories were. I spend my time with my compatriots here uh, remembering those stories, but finding ways that we can again share our lessons learned. Well, have, yeah. Thank you, absolutely. We'll, uh, we'll have a moment for audience questions in just a moment, but, but first, there's one other thing I wanted to ask you all. You know, I, I think now in 2019 is an incredibly exciting time in the aerospace industry. Uh, whether it's civil space or military space, crude exploration or robotic, um, commercial companies, big legacy companies or new startups, there's just a lot going on. A huge amount of it's happening here in Southern California, whether that is the legacy providers like the Boeings of the world, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Obviously, we have SpaceX, we've got Virgin Orbit, we have a lot of, uh, of the smaller companies. I, I know we just had uh, a team from the University of Southern California send a student-built rocket that reached space, the first time that's ever happened. A lot of that happening here. So I, I'm wondering, is there anything about the modern era of, uh, of, of aerospace exploration here in Southern California that particularly captures your attention? And if you had the opportunity to parachute in, if I may, for a day, um, either to learn or to provide advice, is there one place where you know for sure you'd, you'd want to go? Well, it, you're right, uh, Will. It's, it's a really exciting time for aerospace. We all thought it would kind of die out because, let's face it, Congress isn't that interested. Uh, the budgets for NASA are way down. And, uh, but yet the commercial people, the SpaceX, the Boeing, the Blue Origin, uh, all these guys, your company, Will, a uh, lot going on. I, I retired 32 years ago, and I'm still working. With, with NASA and, and these other companies I mentioned because uh, you've got the NASA committed to deep space. Like if you want to go to Mars, you go on a NASA spacecraft. If you want to go to low Earth orbit like the space station, you sign on with SpaceX or Boeing or, or a Blue Origin or, or, or another company. So things are going on in all these areas. The commercial people are talking about they plan to fly people, live people, this year. It's going to slip into next year. But next year's coming right away. 
We're going to be flying people off a of commercial spacecraft. NASA's tra dragging a little bit. They, they won't fly people until probably 2023. But uh, it, it's exciting to me. There's work out there for a lot of people. And uh, there's, there's tools, computer programs that we could not have imagined on Apollo. And people are better educated. Uh, the commercial people, the Elon Musk, the Blue, uh, Jeff Bezos, the Amazon, they're putting money into this, into space like you wouldn't believe. So if anybody wants to get into it, it it's a good place to get. I, I agree with Chuck. It, it's, it's about commercial space development. But more important than that, it's about you and us. We are a nation of explorers, pioneers. It's, there, it's in our nature. It's what we want to do. What's over the hill? What's around the corner? That's what we're about. And we're happiest when we are exploring. Now, with that being said, you look at the early explorers from Europe and the Orient, and you find that what was the motivation behind that exploration? Money, trade, more spices, more, more. So the commercial developers, the commercial companies that are out there, they have a responsibility to their stockholders to have a return on that investment. The government has never really had that return on investment motivation. If they had, it was political. And that's another whole dimension of fog and confusion. So I think that we can look now and say that, again, the companies that are out there commercially looking to accomplish these goals, that's where the future is going to be. But that future, is really not in their hands. It's in the hands of our young people, the youth. They're going to write the future. You know, we learned a long time ago that, yes, you can put your mind to something and accomplish it, but there's certain things that take a certain amount of time, and that's all there is to it. You've you know, 24-hour paint doesn't dry in an hour. So helping, and this is where I guess my goal comes now, helping the children see that future, see a future, it comes down to one, just one simple action and activity. Teach your children to dream because that's what will take us beyond the planets again. All right, so um, uh, we're going to have a brief opportunity maybe for some audience questions. If it's possible to raise the house lights, that would be fantastic. There will be microphones coming around. I'd ask you to wait until the microphone comes. Uh, just uh, because we are going to be filming this and would like to get the question. So if we go maybe right right here in the front, that's possible in the front row. Yeah, yes. Um, I have a question. When they started opening up the astronaut classes to civilians, like what was the general feeling and, you know, all of the different, uh, like, kind of engineering agencies that had to deal with it? Was it, like, exciting or scary to, you know, kind of approach that change? There you go. Uh, did you see the movie Right Stuff? <laughs> a lot of truth to that. Uh, or the, actually, the new one, um, the first astronaut, first man. Excellent film. But, I mean, if, you, if you're a, in the Air Force, if you're a pilot, if you just have the need for speed, uh, it's going to come down to, hey, I want to be an astronaut. But then the reality sinks in, well, what do you have to do to be an astronaut? Well, first of all, you better understand something about STEM. You better understand something about the world as it works. You better understand 
about the environment and the harm's way that you're putting yourself in. One of the reasons that most of the astronauts were drawn from the uh, Corps of Test Pilots was because that's, they had those attributes. And then, of course, you've got to be healthy enough to do that and, and under, undertake the rigors of it. Uh, when I first started going out to classrooms to speak to students in classes, and this is back in the, in the early 60s, I would go out and I would always begin kind of like the church and say, who wants to go to the moon? Who wants to go to space? Who wants to be an astronaut? And everybody would raise their hands. In the 80s when I was doing that and I would go out to classrooms, I'd be lucky to get one or two hands. Something changed along the way. But I think a lot of it has to do with your perception of what it, re what it requires. Um, I think there are a lot more civilian astronauts in the program today because the program is demanding a lot more of those skills that are necessary for the technology that's being applied to run the equipment more uh, problem solvers, people who are quick on their feet, who can think out of the box. And then the other aspect of that is commitment, the commitment again in terms of any kind of program. Are you willing to give your life to something like that? But the astronauts, and, and we've all worked with them and, and met them, they are incredible people, especially the astronauts that we met on Apollo. Uh, and they, work, they would work side by side with us. And they were one of the team. Okay, we'll try and get, okay, all the way in the very, very back, if I may. Thank you. Good afternoon, sirs, and everybody here. Uh, crazy question, warp speed, will it ever be attained? The speed of light? <laughs> Well, warp speed. Man, man to run man. <laughs> warp speed, speed of light, uh, a space vehicle reaching that velocity. Is that possible? The, Sirs? You're talking about the speed of light? Yeah. yeah. Well, probably not. Uh, one thing about the laws of physics is the, the, the more you approach the speed of light, the less acceleration you have, and so you never, never, ever, ever get there, theoretically. But uh, just even if you, uh, you're probably talking about going to other plant, other galaxies or something like, like something is 110 light years away. Let's go there. Well, even if you could go at the speed of light, it would take 110 years to get there, and then 110 years to get back. So it's kind of impractical, I think, to to work on that and work toward that. It just it's just not, you know, our lifetimes are, are too short to think in terms of going to other galaxies and so on. That's my answer. If I hope I hit, hit the right. If you check the NASA website, you'll find that they do have some recent uh, postings there about a warp engine project that's been going on for several years. But it's, it's kind of like the politics that funds these projects. It's if you can't break the laws of nature, then let's change the definition of nature. <laughs> so if you change the definition of warp speed, well, then maybe we can go do that. Um, as with uh, uh, Chuck here, uh, I've just been talking with an astronomical society recently, and we were, I, the frequent question we get is, uh, are there aliens? Is there other life in the universe? Well, actually, I don't have the answer to that question. But I can share with you my thoughts on it, which is there are over 700 trillion galaxies in our universe, estimated. And the 75 the seven and a half billion people on this planet are the only, is the only life in, in that universe? 
Uh, I'm sorry, but good old statistics say <laughs> that ain't going to be true. There's bound to be other life. But again, what is the definition of that? Okay, we have time for about one or two more questions. I do see a small hand in the back. How did you solve the problems with um, the engines if they broke down? Problems of... How do you deal with, I mean, so the, the engines on a Saturn V were putting out, what, a million pounds of thrust, <laughs> a million and a half? Just per engine, yeah. Per engine. Right. That, to give you some perspective, that's, what, about 20 times more power than the world's largest nuclear power plant today, right? So how do you, how do you deal with a system that energetic Strap and that complex? Strap your seatbelt on. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as I understand, if, if you had a problem with the engine, when you're going to the moon, you're riding with all the engines lit up, you're a seven and a half million pounds thrust, and you're on your way and you're not gonna change your mind, that thing's going. <laughs> and so if you have an engine problem, something shuts down or something blows up, Apollo had great capability to abort the mission, which means you blow the command module away from the booster, because the booster's one big firecracker when it gets out of control. And then we have the capability of bringing the command module with the crew in it safely down to Earth. We probably spent more money developing the abort capability than we did going to the moon. Do you guys believe that? Yes. We yes, did. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's safety really first. Want, That's it. If you really want the answer, I would suggest that. Uh, Maybe you come to the Columbia Memorial Center or maybe back here to the library for the Apollo 13 50th anniversary. <laughs> and we'll tell you how that problem was solved. So on that, maybe I'll take moderator's privilege for the last question here. Um, we aren't just on any stage. We are at the Central Library. Um, any one of our guests can leave this panel and go out and have access to more information than any human being had on the planet until very, very recently, and just millions of things at their, at their fingertips. If there's someone who is inspired by this uh, and wants to take a book home, uh, and uh, there's going to be a, quite a run on Downey's aerospace history, so we can't all give this as our answer. <laughs> is, is there a particular book that you like to recommend about space history or more generally about science, technology, engineering, and math that you found gets people a good education or gets them hooked? Well, I'm ready for this question here, because I knew <laughs> he was going to ask. Listen. There are so many, many books out there on space flight, Apollo and the shuttle and all the other stuff. Now, they're all levels, and I didn't know this originally, but think of this. There's a book, a new book, d written by Douglas Brinkley called About America's Moonshot, and it's written at President John F. Kennedy's level. Like, what was he thinking? What was he doing? And then there's books about the head of NASA, the, the administrator of NASA. Those guys write books. Uh, George Miller, on, uh, on, he was head of all men's spacecraft, and he wrote a book. And Siemens, he wrote a book, uh, Chariots, of, Chariots of Apollo. So you can go to those levels. Now go down uh, to the astronaut level. All those guys wrote, not all, but a lot of them did, and they're wonderful. Apollo 8, um, Falling to Earth, which is Al Warden, which he, all of his flight. So the astronaut books are really good. And then you can get on down uh, to where the working level, guys like us, here Jerry writes a book. Uh, there's a guy that we all worked with uh, that worked in materials. So many of the Apollo and shuttle problems were materials like metals and aluminums and composites. That's where a lot of problems and failures occur. And there's books at that level. So when you want to read about space, think first, what kind of level do I want to get into? And there's some wonderful stuff out there. Oh, I had fun with this one <laughs> also. Uh, let me show you some of my reading lists going back to the 50s. First of all, I highly recommend anything written by Jules Verne. Anything. I have about 30, 30 of his books in my collection. 
from Earth to the moon is a good place to start if you're interested in aerospace. But for me, also, Our Friend the Atom by Heinz Haber, Walt Disney made a TV show on it. The other one, Boy Scientist, Boy Scientist, written by Poplar Mechanics Magazine, 1955. <laughs> Angle of Attack, Mike Gray, excellent book on the story of Apollo. There's another set of books that you might ask yourself, well, I don't just read these. You need to know the people side of exploration. Dr. Dwayne Dyer was a personal guru of mine in terms of how to deal with challenges and problems and relationships and teams. Also, Carl Rogers from San Diego University. Anything written by Carl Rogers will not only help guide you in terms of those dreams, but it'll also help guide you in terms of how to manage it and how to get there. And then there's about 15,000 other titles in my <laughs> library that... Uh... Please. I just want to add one thing. I know that somewhere in the archives of NASA, uh, many of the crew members on Apollo took a lot of different pictures of, of their flights. I don't know of any book that may incorporate some of that, but mm -hmm. I, would, I would like to know if anyone knows whether there is a book of photographs that were taken uh, by the astronauts. Anybody know? Well, what you can do is go online and call up that mission, any mission, any astronaut, and you get a lot of that. It's all online. I don't know about the book either, John. I, I just wanted to have the audience yeah. uh, the opportunity in case they were curious about various different Apollo flights. And, uh, and if you can do that, then you get another part of history right online, which is great. So One recommendation uh, that I heard just recently and I think was very good, there was, uh, there's a TV program, if you may have heard of, called Jeopardy. Okay. <laughs> And they just had a young man on there who just broke all kinds of records, making history with winning millions of dollars. But when they asked him how he could learn so much so quickly about so many things, I loved his answer. He said, I went into my daughter's bedroom and read all of her little books for preschool. <laughs> I offer the same kind of suggestion. If you want to learn something about aerospace and the history and the industry, don't jump into the deep end of the water yet. Start with just some of the simple children's books on how the space program started, because it will help guide you <clears throat> to a whole other world of exploration. Here, here. Uh, I'll add a recommendation of my own. I just finished uh, Rise of the Rocket Girls by Natalia Holt, which I thought was a spectacular um, story of a lot of the, uh, the women who were the human computers right up the street at the Jet Propulsion Lab. So again, a great story about Southern California and its ties to aerospace. If any of you are interested in any of those books, I have a great tip for you. I know of a place where you can get all of them for free. <laughs> so come see me afterwards. I can give you some suggestions. Um, gentlemen, I would like to thank you so much. This has been a spectacular opportunity. Um, thank you. Really, really have enjoyed it. Um, as someone working in the aerospace industry today, uh, I'm always called to mind. There's an old expression, which I usually see attributed to Sir Isaac Newton, of if I have seen further, it's only because I stood on the shoulders of giants. Uh, we have a long way to go to see further, but if we ever do, it will be because certainly we were able to build on the stuff you're doing. So I'd like to extend each of you a personal invitation. If you'd like to come and tour my rocket factory, it would be my honor <laughs> to show you around. Fantastic. Well, thank you again, and let me pass it back. To you. Thank you one more final time to William Pomerantz, John Perez, Jerry Blackburn, and Chuck Lowry. If you're interested in attending any more Columbia Memorial Space Center events, we have some more exciting ones on the horizon. 
Uh, we have a, a booth at the upcoming USC Archives Bazaar on October 12th, where we'll have some artifacts on display and be there to answer questions for you. October 19th marks our annual Spooky Science Night. Come in costume to enjoy food uh, and food trucks, slime stations, spooky robots, and telescopes for moon and star viewing. Admission to the event is only $5 per person, with children three and under being free. October is a big month for us at the Space Center because it kicks off our 10-year anniversary year, so keep an eye out on social media for upcoming events to celebrate that momentous occasion. And finally, every April is our City of STEM event. This year alone, we welcome 10,000 people to our site to come enjoy performances by Bill Nye the Science Guy. Yes, that Bill. <laughs> the Amoeba people, and also a full month of STEM-based activities with our partner organizations throughout the greater LA area. Uh, you can find more information at columbiaspacescience.org. You can find us on Facebook, and as you've seen up on the screen this whole time, you can find us on Instagram at Columbia Space. Thank you again so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day.